Perfect. Amazing. Um, hello, hello. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for joining us. Welcome all. Feel free to say hello in the chat if you'd like. Maybe say where you're zooming in from, what you're excited for. Uh, we're so happy to have you here. Um, and I think some more folks are gonna join us as we continue, but uh, for now, let's get started since I know our time is limited and we have such amazing editors here to chat with us today. Um, so hello everyone. If this is your first time joining us for an event, welcome. Kandimon is a literary nonprofit dedicated to nurturing writers and readers of Asian American literature. We see the arts as a tool of empowerment, liberation, and solidarity. Through readings, mentorship programs, our annual retreat, workshops, and online classes, we seek to uplift writers of color and the storytellers of our communities. We offer new online classes each month for writers of color, which you can find on our website. And today we're so excited to share the second installment of our publishing panels for Asian American Writers series, sponsored generously by Penguin Random House. Today we're joined by four accomplished publishing editors who will be sharing the ins and outs of their roles, as well as sharing their advice and thoughts for those who are involved, interested, or curious about the publishing world. We appreciate all of you so much for being here, and we are really grateful to be sharing this space where we can discuss publishing while also dispensing pockets of knowledge within our community. Thank you for your time. We're going to have some really great conversations today. Um, just some housekeeping before we get started. You can turn on subtitles at the bottom of your screen where it says show subtitles. Uh, thank you so much to Jamie at Sign Nexus for the live captioning. We also have ASL interpretation today from Pro Bono ASL. Thank you so much to Chris and Teresa for being here. We're also recording this panel and the video will be sent to all registered participants in the coming days. I'm going to begin by introducing each of our wonderful editors, and then we'll go into a moderated conversation until around 12.30 p.m., and then we'll do an audience Q&A. So let's get started. Yuka Igarashi is an executive editor at Grey Wolf Press. Before joining Grey Wolf in 2021, she was editor-in-chief of Soft Skull Press, founder and editor-in-chief of Catapult Magazine, founding editor of the annual Best Debut Short Stories Anthology and the managing editor of Granta Magazine. Vivian Lee is a writer and senior editor at Little Brown. Her book list includes Matthew Salisis, Jimin Han, Sunel Barnes, and Curtis Chin. Her writing can be found at the Los Angeles Times, Eater, L.com, Catapult, and more. She graduated from the University of California, Irvine with a BA in literary journalism and, and from the New School University in New York with an MFA in creative writing nonfiction. She is a 2018 PW Rising Star honoree. Originally from Los Angeles, she now resides in Queens. You can find more at VivianWMLee.com or on Twitter at VivianWMLee. Alisa Ogi is an editor at Tin House where she acquires poetry, fiction, and literary nonfiction. Originally from Southern California, she received her MFA in poetry from the University of Oregon and taught undergraduate creative writing and AAPI literature before shifting into publishing. She lives in Portland, Oregon. Nidhi Pugalia is an associate editor at Viking Penguin, acquiring fiction and nonfiction with an emphasis on raising BIPOC voices and perspectives. Prior to Viking Penguin, she worked at Grand Central Publishing. She has an MFA in fiction from the New School and graduated from the University of California, Los Angeles as an English major with a core in creative writing. Some of the authors she has worked with include Humdrum Khan, Asha Thanki, Sally Wen Mao, Sahaj Kaurakoli, and Juno Dawson, among others. She is also a writer, a baker, and a violinist when no one's listening. You can find her in Seattle or on Twitter at MakePieNotWar. So, um, as mentioned, we're going to have a moderated Q&A with our four fantastic editors until around 12.30 p.m. Eastern or so, and then we will turn it over to you, our audience, for some Q&A. So please feel free to submit um, questions now and throughout our conversation in the Q&A box. So let's get started. Um, I'd love for all of you to um, take turns answering this. Um, just a very basic preliminary question. What piques your interest when reading a submission? And maybe uh, Yuka, you can get us started with that. 
Sure. sure. Hi, everybody. Thank you all for being here. Um, I didn't want to go first <laughs> in this question, but um, I think a lot of people will probably answer the same way that um, that we that I'm always looking for something that I haven't seen before. That's kind of a basic answer. Um, I see a lot of submissions and, um, you know, there are trends in publishing that you can start to recognize and seeing something a little different is always really good. Um, one thing that I've said before in interviews and things like that and panels like this, that's maybe specific to me or the way that I think about things is that I end up always asking my colleagues or myself if somebody's reading for me, um, if something's funny. And I don't necessarily mean that, you know, something needs to be full of jokes, but I sort of just mean that I, I like when there's a level of generosity and self-awareness and, and something is surprising and, and sort of entertaining as well. So those are the sort of things I look for in addition to sort of what you would expect. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. And um, I love the idea of humor being more than just jokes as well in a manuscript. Um, Vivian, would you like to answer that question next? Sure. Um, yeah, I don't want to repeat what you said, because I agree. I think that, you know, it, it, you know, obviously, it, it feels kind of silly to say, but, you know, really beautiful writing. Um, I want a book that, you know, is trying to answer a question that you can see a writer is really grappling with and have it answer it through the characters, through prose, through themes, um, you know, try to try to interpret it, interpret, you know, whatever's in the world. Um, but then also kind of on the business side, you know, especially coming from um, a bigger corporate publishing place, um, you know, I'm also beholden to making sure that it's something that we can publish successfully here. Um, so something that I might read for fun might not necessarily be something that I can do successfully here. And that has nothing to do with, you know, the quality of the writing. It's really just like, how can we prop a writer for success long term? And how can we prop a book successful for long term? So it's really about balancing that, you know, art part of it and also the kind of business aspect and trying to find that happy medium while, you know, pushing forward what narrative looks like as well. Yeah, that's such a good point. And um, I think we'll get into that sort of more business side of things, like what happens on the other end after a submission is read. Um, uh, so yeah, thank you for bringing up that point. Um, Elisa, would you like to answer the question next? Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with both of them. I think language is very important to me, coming from, you know, prose and poetry, like something that is precise and grabbing really is a great start for me. And then I think a lot about momentum, like, what is going on, whether it's either a scene or an image or a beautiful line that wants to propel me forward into the next pages. And then, you know, I mean, I think this is for all readers, but I'm really excited when something is going on that is surprising and momentum driving. And then suddenly I'm on page 20 and I'm not really sure how I got there. Um, and, you know, it's an ineffable thing, but I do think like an author who can kind of control the momentum of their opening pages is always a really exciting thing. Mm, yeah, yeah, momentum and language. Those are both such important factors that I think we're all kind of thinking about, even if we're not conscious about when we're reading. Um, thank you for bringing those points up. Um, Nidhi, would you like to answer the question as well? Sure. I mean, I agree with everything everyone has said. <laughs> um, there's very little that I think that I can add to that, but I feel like um, to add to this kind of sense of pacing and wanting to be surprised and, and covering, you know, new ground in some way, whether it's offering a new perspective to an old story or discovering a story that hasn't been told before, which there are so many of those around the world. Um, but, but, but even past that, um, I think that the pitch is really, really interesting and can always grab me. Um, even if, it otherwise might seem like it's not new. I think pe people um, spending some time crafting that one to two line pitch is really fascinating because you can see that entry point that they had, what drew their interest and passion to that particular project, which kind of goes to what Vivian was talking about and Yuka were talking about what, when it comes to what question they're seeking to ask about, about the world. Um, and depth of character. I, I really, really am interested in complex characters on the page. 
Um, and I love when we can, we can't reduce a character to a specific, um, I was going to say a character, a characteristic, um, but instead can see the various layers, you know, finding, finding, again, this sounds pretty simple, but finding empathy for someone who might in, an, in a previous iteration have been a villain um, and recognizing that nothing is that black or white on the page. Yeah, yeah, that's such an important point too, thinking about complexity for characters and trying to think about where they're coming from um, beyond what you might see on the page initially. Um, so my next question has to do with um, what you all look for uh, in a potential author, in addition to the submission. Um, so I'll, maybe we can answer it in uh, reverse order, Nithi, not to put you on the spot again, but if you'd like to tackle that question. Um, sure, I will do my best. Um, I think apart from the submission, I, we, we tend, we, we have meetings with the, with the authors before we kind of proceed to any other steps. And I think there's a moment to see whether you share the same editorial vision, because in those conversations or in including any editor, you're kind of bringing someone else into the table, into your brain space where this story or this, this idea, this poet, poem has been living um, for so many years by itself or, or with your agent, whoever, whoever's already been there, but you're introducing a new vision partner um, and your editor may not always want to make the same edits or see the same iterations, future iterations as you do. And I feel like that's an important part of the conversation to talk about, okay, do we want to, is the final, final, final iteration of this what we both want? Or is this come going in a completely different direction? And I think that that is a key ingredient to having a successful partnership. Um, and and yeah, you're, you're introducing somebody somebody to such an intimate space. So I think that becomes really important. Um, and I also um, do look at kind of going on the business side of things. Um, do look at what that author's writing community is like, um, what kind of support they might need, um, what support can we give them to make sure that they can really break out and, and shine. Um, and not every imprint has the ability or, or the resources to support authors at various stages, not to say that there aren't imprints that do, but that's always a question that comes up of, okay, how can we um, bring our skills and our expertise along with this author's community and, and, um, and yeah, community, that's it, but community to come together and create the best, best partnership and best platform for them. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I sense there'll probably be like a lot of overlaps in this panel, which is really cool. Actually, I think it's nice that we're on the same page in a lot of ways. Um, but I also was going to just talk about the importance of that author call and not necessarily to make it stressful on the author, but just like to know that it's a two way street to figure out like, am I seeing your vision too? Because for me, author vision is so important. Like, I just don't want to mess with that. So I really like to be upfront in those calls about like, what are some big things I see for the book? And in case we don't mesh, like that's totally fine. Like that, that's just part of it. But I think when I talk to a potential author, it is important that we have those conversations right off the bat. Um, and then I'll also say, just since I do work a lot in poetry too, um, I do look at individual publications where those poems have been, but it's not necessarily like just for big name publications, like you might think. Um, I actually really love to see deliberate placement of poems or just to see like, are you thinking about where your poems are finding homes? Um, I think like it can be easy to want to just like have poems in as many places as possible, but I actually think quality can be a really um, important marker too. Like, are you placing it in publications you feel really proud to be part of? Um, and that kind of goes back to that point about community and about, um, yeah, just understanding where you are in like the constellation of things in the literary community. Like you said, well, agreed. Um, I think I, I'll just add to it too, is that, um, I think um, a lot of authors are always asking, like, do I need an MFA? Do I need to go to these conferences and all this stuff? You know, like I when I get a pitch from an agent, like, of course, that bio is interesting. I read it, but it's not like I'm going to drop everything and read your submission because you went to Iowa versus like a public school or something. You know, I went to public school. So, um, you know, it's it's less about that. And it's it is more like, let's say, like, where are you building that community? And 
and that can be so many things, right? It can be, you know, where you're involved in literary, uh, in the literary space, um, you know, where are you submitting your work, especially I think as a debut author and, you know, in nonfiction, especially in like a more practical nonfiction space, you know, what does your platform look like? I think that's, you know, that's kind of a more platform driven question. Um, and I think also on the more practical side, you know, if you are, um, you know, thinking about querying soon, like, please have a website. Um, it can be super, super simple, but, you know, just your name, contact information and where you've been published because um, it makes it just easier to kind of look you up and, make, and see that you've kind of at least established a little bit of a foothold um, on the internet. But um, so some, a couple more practical takeaways before I repeat myself here. Um, I also really, think the author call is important. Um, I do feel like there's there's been very little time cases when I've had an author call and I didn't end up offering on something. Like by the time I have an author call, I usually am thinking about offering on a book. And that might be different for, you know, I would be curious to hear um, how, how you all handle that. Um, so, so in a lot of ways, I think of it as, um, as as, as something as, as showing the author what what I could do or what whatever um, publisher I'm working for could do for the book. Um, and what I'm thinking of before the author call is just I'm trying to think long term as much as possible. So you know a book takes like two years to publish sometimes, especially if you work in a small house. And selfishly, I kind of in my brain I have this calculation of like, do I want to be thinking of this book and thinking of this author for two years? Um, and am I going to have the stamina to do that? So, so there's that, that I think about a little bit before I think about what I'm gonna offer, you know, whether or not I think this book is for me. Um, and then even more long-term than that is just, you know, because I work at Grey Wolf um, and we offer a very specific sort of publishing experience. Um, I'm saying like, is Grey Wolf going to help this author get to where they want to be in their career overall. Um, and, you know, I think we, we try really hard to either uh, see, see, at, see us, at, see ourselves as a starting point for authors or as somebody who can really help in whatever stage they're at in their, in their writing life. Yeah, that's a really great, um, that's a really great point in terms of like the long-term relationship with an author that I think all of you um, brought up. Um, Nithi, were you going to add something? I was just going to respond to that question that you asked, Yuka, about, um, about I don't know, the relationship between an editor going to an author call. And I agree. I think, um, you know, that's time that you don't want to waste on anybody's end. So I feel like the intention with which um, I go into an author call is very much, I, I have a large amount of interest. I'm thinking of offering. Um, but I have had instances where that editorial conversation shifts things or um, where, it, where it really shows that, oh, we would not, you know, despite my best hopes, we would not make a good partnership here. And you want to go, whether it's a different direction in that book or a different direction in that career, that the imprint can't support even as much as I love this writing and, and, this author. And I think those are always really tough. Um, and it's definitely more difficult to then have to step back because I think everyone recognizes an intention when you, when you sign up for an author call, but I've definitely had those instances. Um, and, and it's always something, something in that larger question that all of us have brought up about, about author care. Yeah, and since we're talking now about the author call, um, maybe we can transition a little bit into the next question, which is, um, you know, so what is an author call slash like now that you read a submission and you say you love it and you want to make an offer, or you want to get to know the author a little bit more. Um, what happens next? Um, Vivian, I saw you unmuted if you want to answer that question. Oh, sure. Um, I was I was going to continue on to meet these point too, but this is this is kind of part of it too. It's just right. That author call is quite important, you know, before, before you even try to make that next step, which is, you know, either depending on where you are 
in the process, um, talking to your fellow colleagues or bringing it to acquisitions meeting, which is where, you know, depending on your imprint, stakeholders go in and talk about the book, um, both on like a editorial level and then also on the publicity, marketing, sales um, level as well. Um, but I think that, you know, that call is also important because when you want to know like what that vision is, right? So that when you are bringing it to acquisitions, it is, you're putting it, you're propping it up for the best kind of, um, putting it, propping it up as, a, as the best you can so that people can be convinced that you should get money to, to buy this book. Um, so, you know, the author call is also important for the author too, obviously, because you are also working on this book for, you know, two, three years with this editor and you want to make sure that the vision is aligned. Um, I know some writers who just were like, ah, I just wanted to like sell this book and, you know, I just went with this person and I just was unhappy because we were just, we just kept clashing on, on, on the vision of the book and it just becomes a really unhappy experience for everyone involved. So, you know, for authors, I think it's also important to think about what that conversation is like with an editor and be like, can I also spend two, three years? You know, when I ask it them, you know, I, authors always ask me, and I think it's a great question, you know, where does, where is my book going in that bookshelf? Um, what is that book speaking to? And if you don't agree with that, like, you know, that's kind of a hint on how they would market it, how they would pitch it and things like that too. And that's everything that we are thinking of before we would make that author call when we are reading those manuscripts, um, which is also, maybe I'm speaking for myself, um, you uh, read, it takes you a lot longer to read than you would read for, for pleasure because you are thinking about all that stuff to bring to the author call, to bring to acquisitions, to make the best case to, to buy that book. Um, so, you know, it's, it's really about gathering all that, all the goodwill you can to kind of bring it to that next step, which is trying to make an offer. Yeah, thank you for that addition. Um, Alisa, would you like to add to this question of what happens once you've read a submission and you've fallen in love with it? Yeah, um, and I think it's really nice that we're like all coming from like different um, sort of sizes of houses or like different perspectives of that because um, at least at Tin House, um, maybe there's like a little bit smaller of a group that I need to talk with. But if I love a manuscript, I, I can actually like just run to my editorial director and the publisher like very quickly and like we just talk about it and like usually they love it too. And similar to as Vivian was saying, like what I'm thinking about going to author call is, yeah, I'm off, I'm like quite serious at that point. So I, I do like to make sure that like I'm thinking of their book correctly so that I can then pitch it in the right way. Like I don't want to misrepresent a project also. So I do like to ask the author like, oh, like, tell me about the project in your own words. Like, I know I received this, like, really well-tailored pitch, like, in an email, but I'm just curious, like, how are you seeing your project right now? How has it even changed since I received that manuscript? Um, so we have that good conversation, like, we're talking about. And then if it feels like a mesh, then I get to go back. And then we do sort of, like, um, sort of figure out the, like, offer details. Um, and then, you know, it's, it's a pretty simple, at least on, for us, it's a pretty simple, like whenever the agent says it's time to send the offer, I send the offer. But um, yeah, I just, it's, it's a really like um, relatively linear process for me. But at the same time, as everyone's talking about, I'm thinking about a million things at once, because should this be a positive acquisition, this is something we're like almost preparing for a marathon together. So like a lot of things start to need to get lined up. Yeah. Is it okay to jump in? Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> um, I, I completely agree. And I feel like both of you are bringing such good points of this other side of that um, two-year kind of process that Yuko is bringing up, where it is, it is also the author who's agreeing to this long-term commitment. Um, and in that vein, I also like to ask um, what their edit what their own editorial, like how their manuscript has shifted. You know, Elisa, you're talking about talking about the book in their own on their own terms and I feel like part of that is just okay so how how do you edit how did you what what, what was this 
when you first began and how has that shifted and why? And I think that's always really interesting. Um, and then that becomes another thing, especially if I can bring, um, you know, my, my team at Viking Penguin is huge. Um, so opposite of what Elisa is talking about. And it becomes this kind of matchmaking scheme of, of trying to find the little like niche that I can, I can find this project a home in and make it different from all the other books in our list. And that's why it's so helpful to have those conversations about that vision and about that process, because all of those things become part of the goodwill that Vivian brought up that, that we can take to the rest of the team and use it. Um, and, and in that way, really any little thing that you can give about, about voice, about community, um, about um, where, about the thoughtfulness of where you sought to be published, all of those things kind of come together there. Um, and for me at a large imprint, it's, it becomes, it becomes even more important because those fine lines are really what will make a project shine, even if we have a parallel one in a different genre or from a different perspective on, on the list. Um, so, so yeah, otherwise, um, I'm sure you've heard of comp titles. Um, so that's one of the pieces that we're bringing to the table. Um, and it's another part of that package of how to separate this because we're looking for, hey, things in this cloud of space, um, sometimes parallel genre, sometimes parallel voice, sometimes it's like, yeah, this book also had a ghost story. And the one that I'm pursuing here also has a ghost story. Um, this is set by the sea. This has a strong um, female protagonist and this one does too, or this is flipping that. This is finally introducing a strong woman where there have always been male voices. That There's so many ways to kind of spin an argument. Um, so don't feel like, oh, I can't make a new argument here, you can. You just have to find the little like kernel um, that makes yours unique. What's the question that you're asking? Um, so we'll look at those comp titles over the past couple years and kind of build a story around that and, and take it. Um, so, so yeah, so it's always, and even in that, it comes back to what Elisa was talking about, where it's always interesting to see what other books on the shelf you see your book next to. Um, and that helps us kind of take that comp list. Yeah, thank you for bringing up um, comp titles, uh, which we can get into um, later on this conversation. I think we have time for maybe uh, one sort of quick question before we transition into the audience Q&A portion. And thank you to everyone who's submitted so far. Um, but like, let's say, let's skipping down the stages of publishing and you are already working with an author on their book. Um, what should writers know about communicating with you as their editor? Um, and maybe uh, Yuka, if you'd like to answer that question. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think basically the editor author relationship is similar to any other relationship. So like some of the same rules apply. Um, and one thing that took me a really long time to learn and that I'm still learning is just over communicate, I would say. It is like the one word I would say. Um, I have trouble with it too. And I understand the, you know, wanting to hide <laughs> if you're in a stage where you don't want to hear from people or you're not, not necessarily ready to share. But one thing I've learned over the years is just even saying that, like being like, you know, being able to write to someone and be like, I got your message, need to think about it for a second. Um, I, I'm not ignoring you has been, a, yeah, has been huge for me just learning that. Um, and yeah, so I think I think that's true of authors too, where I understand there's times when I think every writer or every person has is juggling so many different things and you feel like you can't um, you know, you can't always attend to everything. But yeah, over communicating is good. And then, you know, but I think also a lot of writers get in touch often out of anxiety and things like that. So when I say over communicating, I don't mean like, you know, <laughs> like saying every single thing that you think of in an email, but, um, but just, just being very clear about, about where you are and, um, and um, yeah, just think, thinking, of, thinking of it as like, what would you do for any other, I mean, it doesn't mean that you're, you have to be best friends with your editor or that you're um, dating them. Like, I think that people sometimes use metaphors like that about editor, and I think those are true, but I think, you know, there, there are boundaries that are important also. So it's just like, but just think about, you know, generosity, kindness, empathy, you know, so just normal relationship things, and I think you'll be okay. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, would anyone else like to chime in on this? 
I just wanted to say like oh, totally along those same lines, the word that popped into my head was transparency. And again, it's like a both ways kind of thing. Like I, I, I just think like it's really important that if an author has like a concern, like right away, or like is like thinking like, I want to radically rewrite this poem or whatever it might be. It's okay, just tell me ahead of time so I know because it's really hard when we get deeper into a production process and we're like, put it, we've already sent it to like a copy editor or something. And then it's like, I want to change so much. And on my end, I just don't want to introduce errors. Like I just want to be in the service of your work, for instance. So like transparency about concern. And then in turn, I try to be really clear or as clear as I can be about like timelines and like, what's coming up. Like, I like to send like little emails of just like, here's what's coming up this month. Like, be ready for it because, um, you know, we've been talking about it as a marathon and something that my editorial director, Maisie Cochran says is she's like, publishing is a weird marathon with a bunch of little sprints in it. And like, to just be prepared for the sprints that might come of like, we need to suddenly turn around proofreading corrections, like, like quicker than we thought, like, are you ready to do that next month or whatever it might be. Um, and so just having that communication has really meant that my relationships have been better with my authors, I think. Um, so yeah, that's what I was just thinking is like transparency. And um, I had not heard of the dating relationship thing, so I'm glad I hadn't, <laughs> but anyways. I um, love that, the marathon thing. Yeah, please go ahead, Nidhi. Sorry. Um, no, I have also not heard the dating thing. Fascinating. Um, but, but yeah, I think I really love that idea of a marathon with a bunch of little sprints because that could not be more accurate. Um, and kind of on the same vein of transparency, I feel like there are no stupid questions that you could really ask an editor. I feel we often, and I think this is true of, true of anyone, you forget what lingo you've just absorbed because you've been in um, in this role or this job for so many years. So if you're confused about, okay, what's the difference between proofreading and copy editing? Why are they happening at this time and not at that time? What's, what's going on? What are passes? All of those questions are perfectly reasonable to ask. And I am so happy to explain it. I feel like that really, you know, the, it, it, why does it take two years to publish a book? Those questions, you can see all of the building blocks and why you need to turn in a manuscript so early, even though there's still like eight months to your to your publication date, things like that. Um, so don't don't be afraid to ask those questions. Um, and I feel like it's it's been really great to have that level of honesty and transparency about timeline, about other books that are being published. For example, why are we moving the on sale date? All of, all of those little pieces. Um, there are always answers, and I think it makes for a stronger relationship when when you can be honest on both ends about what's going on. Yeah, that's so true. So, so far we have points about transparency, over communicating, but having boundaries and also asking questions. Um, Vivian, did you want to chime in on this at all before we move on to the next questions? I mean, I think everyone has brought up good points. I think I don't know what you don't know. So it's always good to just ask. So, um, but on the other side, a bit again, those boundaries, you know, like take I, this is the this is the pl place to be like also just incredibly organized as a writer when you're going through this like write down those dates if you ask me a question and I answered already like table it so you know not to ask it again so you know just like making sure that we're working together so that um, we can be productive in that way too and make sure that you know the questions are in favor of or you know or help support the your the publication of this so let's let's make it an easy journey for both of us as much as possible so that we can kind of get to the heart of the harder work of of, of publishing a book yeah thank you all so much um so we're going to transition now into our audience q a um seeing some really great questions popping up in the q a um and we've also enabled upvoting on the questions so um, audience members, please feel free to upvote any questions that you'd like to see get answered. Um, so let's get into it. Um, okay, we have a question here. Would you share your process in your publishing house about how you decide on the final title of a book? Oof, title is so important. And how much author input is involved in titling and deciding on the final book cover? So I'll leave that open for whoever wants to jump in. I'd love to jump in here because we just had to do this like a week or two ago. And it was really, it was just really fascinating. Um, I felt like I learned a lot in the process. 
Um, so to kind of set the scene, we had a book that came in um, titled Paper Flowers. Might as well give the whole story. Um, but it was titled Paper Flowers. And it is a um, kind of a modern day Rebecca. It's set on the, the it's set in a Gothic manner um, and it's solving the mystery of a woman that was murdered a hundred years previous. Um, so it has those different, it, it's kind of in an upmarket commercial space um, and it's trying to appeal to a Gothic audience, people who were coming to read Mexican Gothic or did read Daphne du Maurier. Um, but the title didn't match that pitch. And it was a very interesting conversation to kind of consider the marketing package that we're going for here and what can we do um, to, to give readers a proper idea of what the book is. Paper Flowers had a very literary feel to it. It had this kind of intangible sense to it. Yeah, it's not, it's not going to grab people in the same way or, or make them think of ghosts or make them think of of the things that we want them to understand about this book so we had to sit down and brainstorm a new title and that was fascinating to kind of consider that we are creating a whole package here it's it's not necessarily about i mean it is about the most beautiful title and you want to have a gorgeous title and all of those things but there are other elements that play here when thinking about that title so we sat down and we compared it to the cover um and part that conversation was, you know, how much of this heft does the image on the cover have to hold by itself? And can we, by changing the title, share that, share that burden, share that effort um, so that the, the cover doesn't have to work all by itself. Um, so those are the kind of things that that might cause a title to shift. And this was quite, um, quite later, late in the process, I had already handed over the manuscript to our production team. Um, and we were already working on the cover, we were already pitching for that season. Um, and in fact, we're, we're a little late, um, and not late, but quite along in pitching for that season to our sales team um, and our internal people. So, so yeah, so that was, that was a fascinating process. Um, and, you know, one thing to say is that you don't need to have the right title coming in. Um, that's not going to make or break it um, in terms of whether an editor will come. Um, but it's, it's just another little seed to kind of throw out there into the world and draw the readers that you want to read this book. Yeah, thank you for that, uh, sharing that example. I feel like, yeah, titles are, are so important. And as someone who really struggles with titles, it's good to know that this is like a whole conversation behind the scenes at a, at a given publishing house. Um, gonna move on to the next question. So we have a question that's about advances. Ooh, can you please address the range of advances that are reasonable for a first time author pitching a nonfiction manuscript? The financial components of the industry are so obfuscated. Um, I'd love to hear um, you all weigh in on this um, for a range of manuscripts. So this person was specifically asking about nonfiction, but yeah, I'll open the floor. I really think it depends. I know it's such a wishy-washy answer and I'm sure you are cursing me, but you know, it really depends, I think, on the subject matter. It depends on your platform. It depends on where this which house is bidding on it. If there is a if there is an auction, which is when multiple um publishing houses imprints within publishing houses are trying to buy to acquire this book. Um it also depends on like the research level, you know, if I, I think it's just there's just such a huge variety of advances that you can, you know, I've at a smaller place, I've offered, you know, $8,000, $10,000, you know, and, and there's some places, you know, now that I've offered, you know, 200, 300. So it's just the, the range is just, it just really varies. And it doesn't really have to do with the quality of the work. It's really just about all the other kind of um, business matters of publishing a nonfiction book, if that is helpful. Yeah, definitely. Um, Yuka, would you like to weigh in as well? Sure. I just wanted to say, yeah, Grey Wolf has one of the things about working at independent houses that we just have a lot less money to work with. So we very rarely we pay I mean, our advances are in the thousands usually. So even for nonfiction books, and um, we have a Grey Wolf nonfiction prize, where which is based on a proposal and a hundred pages. And right now we pay twelve thousand for that. Um, the point I want to make about advances, though, is that I know there's a lot of focus on 
on that in terms of um, money. But um, one thing that I think is really important for writers to think about is whether they're going to earn out their advance. Um, earning out advances is, is is a really good thing to do. So if you if you get a really big advance, of course it's great because money is great. Um, but if if you don't earn out that advance, sometimes it makes it sometimes it can make it more difficult to to uh, get your next book published. Um, or you know, so so I think so you know royalties are a thing. Like you get money if if you earn out your advance and you sell more than you know your advance, you you get money for as once you earn out your advance, you get money for for all the books that you sell. So um, so I think. Uh, you know, it, it's a, it's a very different calculation for me than for for others at different houses. But I I, I do try to emphasize that um, that that's not that's not the only factor financially. And again, it's the difference between thinking sort of long term and and sort of cashing out. Yeah, thank you both for weighing in on that question. Um, Apologies, there's a siren in my neighborhood right now. Um, but okay, so let's move on to another question. Uh, we have two similar questions. So I'm gonna try my best to synthesize this. Is it better to finish writing a book or have most of it done or to have a few chapters done and pitch it? I think this is specifically pertaining to nonfiction projects, whether it's a memoir or a collection of um, essays. So um, do you have any advice on which option agents or editors would prefer? I think that from an editorial perspective, I prefer more rather than less. Um, and that's for a couple of reasons. One um, makes the argument easier on my end to say, hey, I can specifically point to these essays. I can, I can point to, to their voice here. Um, and I have proof that they can execute the, what they're proposing um, in, in these chapters. So that just is so helpful and has been a barrier before to getting a project through if I don't have chapters. Um, so so that, can be, that can be really helpful. Um, I also think it makes it easier to talk about editorial vision if there are more chapters. Um, to see where, where we match, how we want something to come to fruition. Um, but with those two things said, I'm not saying you need your whole manuscript. It, I, I don't think you need your whole memoir, um, but having more than just one chapter is just really useful to have that conversation. Um, and I think this is true for for kind of for anything, but maybe maybe more so for nonfiction. I edit more fiction, so I'd love um, anyone who works more in nonfiction to chime in here. Um, but I think nonfiction is a little more fluid um, because you're it, you're the the editor might shift where they want to emphasize something, or if it's not a memoir, but it's actually something that is research-based, maybe you need um, part of your advance money to go into supporting your research. So it really shifts what kind of nonfiction project it is um, to determine how much you really need. But think of it in terms of how much do I need to be convincing? Um, what, what is the best way I can put an argument forward that I can do this and I can do it well, and I'm, I'm the only voice or the best voice to, to pitch this particular story? Yeah, I really agree with that. And I think like, for me, it helps to have a sense of the reason, um, like where where the project is at. And like, is, are, am I seeing it now because it's just like research needs to happen and then we're going to shape it together? Or is it actually not quite ready for me? And like, actually you as an author still need time with it to develop it or be with your agent and develop it, whatever it might be. So I'm, I'm always like thinking whenever I receive a partial manuscript, like, why is it coming to me now? Um, I think is just important thing for me to think about. And, and you know, sometimes it is the time, it is really exciting, um, but it just depends. And so, yeah, it's, it's again, I don't mean to have like a wishy-washy answer, but that's what I think about with nonfiction. Yeah, thank you both. Um, we have two questions pertaining to short story collections. Um, for short story collections, do you look to pair it with a novel in a book deal? Is this something writers should strategize? Then another person had a question about whether um, the rumors are true. It's hard to sell a story collection. So I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Um, I can start it off. Um, 
at least at Tin House, um, we don't need a novel with it. We're really excited about short story collections. And I think we've had some pretty cool successes with short story collections lately um, with Morgan Talty's Night of the Living Res, Kim Fu's book, um, short story collection. Um, and I think that for me, it's like, I wanna get excited about the collection, what stories are happening, what the writer is doing in this particular form. And at least for us, maybe we just have the nimbleness that we can just focus on that project. Um, I definitely think like if you're working on a novel that's exciting to know about and like to hear about, because again, if we're thinking long-term, like we wanna support the author through their journey. So like if a novel is on the, on the horizon, that's something that we can prepare for and think about. Um, but at least for us, like, that we can we do start by focusing on the short story collection and moving forward with that um I, was there a second part of that question maybe i'll just stop there for now <laughs> no i think that was a great answer yeah um would anyone else like to chime in love short stories yeah short stories are great we need more of them more collections um, we have a question regarding sort of internal processes. Um, Vivian mentioned some of the factors she has to consider on her end internally, acquisitions, et cetera. Could the panelists speak to this more, pull back the curtain on what they are managing on their end? Um, would you like to start off with that, Vivian? Um, sure. I mean, I think I, I'm hoping I'm answering this question correctly, but I think there's a very romanticized version of an editor and like a cozy corner in their like apartment or like house. And they're just like reading all the time with like a cup of tea. Um, I spend most of my working hours on email. Um, and that is, you know, chasing authors on something. Um, it's production, whether that's a, you know, making sure that a copy edit is going in the right place, making sure that I have um, a jacket cover brief done, writing copy for the hardcover back, um, chasing people for blurbs, um, answering emails from agents. Um, you know, there's all this stuff. And so like it, I don't get to read until after working hours and our weekends. Um, so I think that is what I'm, I already forgot your question. Um, I, <laughs> I'm just like thinking about what to do this after this call. <laughs> um, and I, 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 I think, uh, <laughs> yeah, I think that there's just so much that goes into this work that isn't even the editing part of it. So that like, when I actually get to the editing part of it, it is a joy, um, but I do have to really make time for it. And I think that's also why, again, going back to that author fit, that vision fit is so important because we are taking that time that is you know, basically unpaid to work on the parts that we want and to really make this book shine. So um, that's why it's so important that, you know, like for me, like I don't acquire a lot because I wanna, I wanna enjoy the work that I'm doing outside of the work that I have to do. Yeah, that's such a good response. Um, would anyone else like to weigh in, Nidhi? I, yeah, I just really identify with everything you just said. Um, and I just want to emphasize editor is a misnomer. It's not, I feel like it's not the right title that any of us have. I feel like project management is a huge part of this and just being, you know, we're the we're the connecting point between the author and like every other department. We're translating back and forth um, from art, marketing, publicity, the larger editorial teams, vision, the sales team, everything. Um, and, and I think, you know, um, about pulling back this kind of curtain of what we're managing. It's also one of many projects that we're doing that for um, and we're juggling constantly. And so sometimes um, with, with this effort of, you know, I also have this manuscript that I'll be editing after this call. Um, and, and just, you know, just, just a reminder that, um, that we're all working very passionately and, and outside of working hours to kind of get get things back to you but we're also human and experience burnout and sometimes that plays a factor in things that could get delayed or come earlier or whatever the juggling of everything um and so just just want to mention um and yes donate to the harper collins union strike hardship fund um and that's it yeah thank you all for um these very honest answers um 
Our next question um, has to do with trends in publishing. In terms of the trends you observe from your roles, is there a big change in publishing that has occurred in the past few years that you find relevant for emerging writers, especially writers of color? Are there enduring constants that are also perhaps worthy of note? Um, so I'll open the floor for whoever would like to answer that question. I would say don't write into a trend, write what you wanna write. Um, as, I mean, based on the things we've talked about, you know, once we acquire a book, there's two, three years before the book gets published. So anything that's in trend right now has been thought about two, three years ago. So, you know, by the time you want to write into that trend, like it might already be quote unquote over. So just like write what you are obsessed about, write, a, you know, write through the questions that you've been trying to ask yourself as a writer. And, you know, that is always going to break through um, to the right editor. So for me, trends are kind of just a fun little, you know, marketing thing, but not necessarily something that will give your book and your career longevity. You know, for me, it's, it's about, does this book stand the test of time? Um, can, can it be course adopted? You know, are people going to talk about it years from now? Um, in some way or not. So, or even is this a capsule of a time that is like a really wonderful little capsule? Um, so I, I think I think write what you want to write and the right place will find it. Yeah, I think that's really great advice. And um, would anyone else like to weigh in? If not, we can move on to the next set of questions. Uh, we had a couple of different questions about poetry. So advice for querying poetry manuscripts, um, what you're looking for in a poetry um, submission. So yeah, maybe Elisa, you could start us off with that. Yeah, definitely. You know, I think it's hard because there's so much information about like how to query for fiction and nonfiction perhaps, but poetry is obviously a little different because you, you can't necessarily write the same like here's a summary of the narrative and all, I mean, like often you can, but I think you just have to think about like, what are you hoping to like get across to someone who asks you, oh, this is your debut manuscript, what is it about? And maybe for poetry, that just means focusing more on themes or, you know, styles, forms, elements that just stand out to you to pass along to me so that when I jump in, I'm excited to see those things and like, dig into what's happening in the poetry collection um and then uh what was the second <laughs> so sorry my brain what was it what, what it else was I think um What's... just specifics of what you're looking for in a poetry oh manuscript. right like, does it need to be finished things like that totally um so I it does not necessarily need to be finished but again I just like to know that the writer has a sense of the arc that they want to tell in a manuscript like uh, and this is maybe individual to me, I don't want to speak for every poetry editor, but I like to think about what makes something a, like collected poems versus a collection of poems, like a manuscript of poems. And so I like to know like what is holding this set of poems together. Um, so being able to kind of speak to that in some way is important. And then for me particularly, I just love thinking about place, like geography, language, um, and I'm also just a real sucker for being interesting with form. Um, and again, maybe this goes back to my original comment about loving momentum, but I think there's something so cool when you open a book and you turn the page and it is both a continuation of what's happened, but also something new. And so form can do that in a really interesting way, as can changes in voice. Um, so something I recommend to a lot of poets is think about the first 30 pages of your manuscript. And are you like in some ways sharing um, what this book is with a reader in those first 30 pages in some way? Like don't front load all the sonnets in the first 30 pages. Like think about variety, think about momentum and flow um, because a reader will read those first 30 and decide if they wanna keep reading. Um, so that's just something I think about a lot. I wanna add to that short stories, I see it that way as well. Like what is that momentum, what is holding the work together, whether it is interconnected, whether it is related by place, theme, things like that. So I think that's also how, just to go back to that, um, that short stories for me is, is about what is the story is it telling, same as also what you're saying about poetry. Totally. And I should also say like, you know, it doesn't all have to be about the exact same theme. Like I don't need like 
70 pages about one single thing, but I do, I just love it when I go through a collection, I get to that end poem and somehow it's all coalesced into something larger than it is. Like, oh, you want that moment of just like the sigh, you know, so yeah. The moment of the sigh, yes, um, I love that. Um, we have a question sort of shifting gears a little bit. Um, any tips on how to get your foot in the door if you're trying to become an editor or work in the publishing industry in general as a BIPOC? Um, I'll open the floor to anyone who wants to take that. Um, I'll say that like, Something that's been really cool now that so much is online is that there are more editors like kind of like this, like talking about their careers and like how they got into their positions and even like the pitfalls or the benefits of their roles. And so I'd say to just like keep an eye out for like working professionals conversations about what they do and seeing the routes that they've taken. Um, I, I attended this really great talk by Jen Baker. Um, like just a few months ago uh, about talking about what it means to be an editor. And so I think like that's maybe just one potential starting point is just like hearing how people got into it and how that might fit into the life you're leading right now and how you could maybe like merge in some way. And that's not specific, but I know everyone comes from such different places that it's kind of hard to nail it. I would also say, you know, again, think about building your community, right? Follow the editors that you, whose career you appreciate, ask them out for a coffee, you know, treat them to a coffee and just ask them um, how they kind of got to where you, where they got, like, I'm always going on coffees with people who want to break into the, in the industry. And I love doing that because, you know, so many people that I now work with were starting, you know, were those coffee breaks, you know? Um, and so I think it's, it's, I think there are more people who are eager to help you break in than there are not. I mean, it's the more at us at the table, the better that publishing is. So I think, you know, have finding those people, finding those mentors who can help you. And also like, you know, if, if there's no job out there yet, like it doesn't mean that there won't be a job in the future, you know, work on things that are related, kind of build up your resume build up your kind of muscle editing muscle doing doing other things that can kind of help you that's not you know if it's not a publishing a publishing job per se because you know not everyone can afford to do um, internships not everyone can afford to do a publishing course those are those are you know financially a huge burden for for many people so I think there's just about being creative and finding that path that makes sense for you to kind of keep building on that and just making those um, real, uh, connections. Um, and kind of building on, on that answer, there's always a way to spin your, your story. Like there is always something that you can pull from your experiences that will cater exactly to that position. So don't, don't feel like, oh, well, that title didn't have editorial in it, or it didn't have whatever the, the keyword in it. I bet you that there are transferable skills that you can build upon to get to the next step there. And there's so many kind of like everything from, you know, seeking um, from volunteering at whatever your local writing community areas are from for tweeting at people and asking if they want to chat in whatever format to being a writer's assistant, re really anything to be, and, and you know, like the building blocks, the the um, the starting careers in an in, in editorial, for example, or really anywhere, they're assistants roles. So if, if your skills are, I am great at answering phone calls and I am great at scheduling, those, those are actually very key towards, as we're talking about all the other aspects of our job, those are very key. So don't feel like, oh, well, if I didn't have a specific job in this umbrella, then I don't qualify. You do. There's, there's a way to build that. Yeah. Thank you all for answering those questions. Um, we have a, some questions here about working with agents. Um, can you talk about how you work with agents? Are there certain agents you work with more often or that you prefer? Um, and how do you prioritize agent submissions? So I guess that's sort of a three-part question. Um, how do you work with agents? Are there certain agents that you've worked with frequently more than others? Um, and how do you prioritize agent submissions? I haven't talked for a while, so I can, I can talk. Um, so 
Yeah, I think with, um, I do get a lot of my submissions from agents and I, I think it's, um, it's more, if the, it, it is true that I will pay attention to certain agents submissions more than others. And it's more just if they know me <laughs> and if they understand how familiar they are with the gray wolf list or with my list, um, because then I know, you know, there's certain agents will send me something once every six months and be like, you know, I haven't had something for you for a while, but here's something that I think you would actually really like. And then if, if they're, you know, if they're being tr serious and, and honest, then I can, I can sort of know that like they've thought about it and they've thought about who they've sent it to. Um, there are other agents who are, are submitting widely, um, which isn't, which is a strategy. I don't think it's, it's necessarily bad, um, but there, it's less likely for me to be able to pick that up, especially since if there's competition, sometimes like we're not even in the running um, as a as an indie house. So so I think tailored, or I, I like there are certain agents where I'm I'm you know more likely to pay attention if I see their name in my in my inbox. I also want to add, you know, if you're a writer who's at that stage right now querying. Um, an easy way is seeing what books kind of are speaking to you in what you're writing, see who's agented by them, see who else that they um, have on their list and query the people that way too. So you, they kind of already know that work. And it, it, it's a good question to ask agents when you are querying, you know, you know, when you get to that stage where they want to represent you, like, who do you want to send this book out to editorial, editorial wise, because um, I think that's also something that can help you find the best agent for you as well. Um, someone who knows what your book is about and knows which editors would like the book so that it's not just, you know, kind of floating out and having that strategy, I think could be helpful. Yeah, I think that um, those are both really helpful and specific uh, responses. Um, so speaking of agents, we also had a question about what is the timeline like from when an author, or sorry, when you receive a submission from an agent till you get to that author call? Um, Nidhi, would you like to answer that? <laughs> I think the time can really vary. Um, there, there is a real influx of, of submissions um, at all times, I'm sure from the agent side, from, from our side. Um, and you know, the, the ball is always rolling. So from, I, and I also actually think that the time from when an agent submits a manuscript um, or a proposal to when that author call is, has lengthened over the past couple of years. Everything is going a little bit slower for whatever reason, burnout, um, many more submissions, you know, there's a whole influx of things. Um, so I wouldn't, I, I guess I don't have a real answer here, but <laughs> I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't be too worried if, if you're still waiting at that stage. For example, I received a submission last April and the agent just followed up. It's almost February to say that they've just received interest. And that is not a sign that that submission wasn't worthy. It's not a sign that it wasn't beautifully written and eloquent and had a great pitch. It's just a sign of the number of submissions that everyone is reading. And that's been true kind of across the board of things, of things picking up. Um, so, so yeah, so that's, that's my answer. Um, I think that most editors are trying hard to respond, even if it's later than they, than they wanted to originally. Um, so I think it's a good rule of thumb that your agent is, is following up and is going to get an answer for you. Yeah. Thank you for answering that. Um, we also had a question about um, more experimental or hybridized forms of writings um, are less are less common forms of writing ever appeal ever appealing to you. Uh, for instance, an interleaved collection of essays and poetry. Uh, can you speak about the current appetite for more experimental prose works in your respective publishing houses? Um, Elisa, would you like to start us off with that? 
Yeah. Um, I mean, I think, uh, again, something that's cool about working maybe at a smaller indie press is that we're less, uh, well, I shouldn't say that. I mean, it, it really varies amongst houses, but um, at least for us, we're always open to like hybrid work, things that cross genre, things that don't necessarily fit into um, certain molds, um, because I think like it's just interesting and exciting for us to see what we can do with them. Um, you know, we're a relatively small staff. We only put out about 30 or so books a year. So we have that ability to kind of like focus on the individual project and then like see what comes of it. Um, and we're um, able to just like think of it. Yeah, I mean, it's always important to think of things in terms of genre, like where do you best see your book fitting? But at the same time, we're really open to like, oh, if it's essays, but it has all these like very lyrical poetic elements, like what can it be? What else um, What else can it become? So um, it's kind of a wide answer, but I think like for me, when I see something that's like breaking genre, it's exciting and not a deterrent um, at this stage for me. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, would anyone else, else like to weigh in on this question? Um, just to just to say same, I would say the same thing for Grey Wolf. Grey Wolf sort of had a lot of breakout successes with specifically hybrid types of writing, and sometimes um, my former boss, the publisher Fiona McRae, would say that we like gentrified that genre until now everybody else wants it too. Um, I do think there's appetite, and I see more submissions that that are experimenting with crossing genres and forms. Um, and now we can't afford them. I'm just kidding. But um, um, yeah, I think I think um, I, I, I do think that 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 is a really exciting thing to see that people are are are, are um, experimenting with genre. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, we also got some questions, a lot of questions actually, about this question of um, platform and community for a writer. Um, so when panelists discuss a writer's community as being important, um, what does that mean exactly? Is that public public facing platform, um, internet presence? Um, is it a deal breaker also if you haven't had any prior publications? So um, we'd love to know all of your thoughts on that, like social media, prior publications, how important is all of that when you're weighing these factors? Um, and Nidhi, maybe you could start us off with that, since I think you alluded to this before. Sure. Um, I think that I think that Elisa made a really good kind of conversation about this earlier. State like community being thoughtful, I think is is a really important factor. Um, and I think that goes more to your vision and seeing where seeing the depth of understanding you have of of your book and the kind of career that you want to build. In terms of those literal numbers, like social media presence, um, number of articles, blah, 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 blah. In my mind, they're frills. It's great to have them. It makes it makes another leg of the argument for me to be like, hi, other people also agree that this person is brilliant and I want to work with them. Um, but is it does it mean that it's a no if you don't have those things? No, it's just addition. It's, it's great. It's lovely. Um, but I feel like Debut authors are breaking out all the time. Debut authors are incredible to work with. And we're thinking of a long-term career. You know, there's also this kind of aspect of like, I want to get them before other people see that they're brilliant too, so that I can work with them. <laughs> and we can have, we can have that burgeoning partnership for however many years. Um, so, so yeah. So I guess the short answer is. The more, um, the more whatever frills you have, the easier it is for me to pitch to to other people. Um, but I don't need them. I, I think that there's a lot of voice and partnership, and and the the core of your idea, the the pitch of it, is the most interesting part. And seeing if we can have like a good partnership and envision for for this book and many to come are are the main factors there. Um, plus, obviously, your submission. Yeah, would anyone else like to answer this question? Um, I think there was a clarifying question too about how do you define community in more tangible ways if it's like a, if it's your writing network um, or anything else? I mean, I think it's, yeah, it's writing network. It's, do you have a connection to your local bookstore or, or the library systems or schools or um, 
you know, if you're writing something that's more platform driven, you know, I'm thinking specifically nonfiction, you know, something that is about a subject, you know, if you're a subject matter expert, like who, like, where have you been talking about this before? You know, have you been on panels? Um, have you written pieces about it? Um, there's just so many different ways it can be what that community is like. But, you know, for me, it's, you know, obviously, like, if you're, if your project is strong enough to kind of hold its own, it's great. It's like the cherry on top, but it also helps when we get to the kind of um, business side of it, of just like, how can we employ these, these kind of pillars that you have, you have been leaning on or, or building before this that can now help you kind of bring it to a, a wider audience, to that audience, but then, but then wider as well. And, and also on the, on the other hand, you know, like, do you care? Um, I think it's about caring about, you know, being that literary partner to other people. You know, it's, it's writing. I think that the, the act of writing is lonely, but the, but it's not in a vacuum. So it's, it's where are you, who are you speaking to? Who is your audience? Um, I think all of that is also part of community as well. Yeah. And I just want to add to like, obviously this is a publishing panel and we're talking about editing and authorship and all this important stuff, but it's also good to think about like, are you having an enjoyable, sustainable writing literary life? And I think that's why I talk about community so much and like where your poems or your work finds homes, because it's very, obviously it's important to get your work published and to have a book. And I think that's so wonderful, but like, are you enjoying the world that you're in with your writing? And I think that's what we're speaking to as well, because like, I, I've personally not published anyone who doesn't have any publications, but I think it's because it means that they're like sharing their work and they're engaging with other journals and other people and other writers. And so that feels exciting to me because it's not just someone only in a vacuum of their own work. Um, it feels bigger than that. And so that's like just something to I think about as well. Yeah, I love that. The idea of having an enjoyable, sustainable life as a writer beyond your immediate projects. Um, we have a question about, uh, would you ever consider taking on a project that needs bigger structural edits? And when would you take something like that on? Yeah, I can jump in real quick and just say like, um, I think you guys spoke in this too, but um, as a smaller indie house, we can't always offer the advances or the financial side of things that like perhaps a bigger house can do. But what we can do perhaps is take a risk on something that maybe needs more structural work or more time with an editor directly and, and shape it and, and rethink it together to make it into a strong project even stronger, you know? So I, I always like the opportunity to be able to have that collaboration. I actually am not necessarily looking for like the most polished thing. Um, if I see a spark of something that gets me excited and I want to spend the two years with it. Um, and yeah, and I think that's something I do talk about in my author call. Like, are you hoping to have it published as is, or is there room for me as an editor to play a part as well? Because um, I want to, I, I want to be in, in partnership and conversation. Um, so yeah, I think that I, I have done a lot of structural changes to projects in the past. Um, I've also done like a lighter hand on projects, but it's definitely not a deterrent if there is something in there that grabs me as an editor. And just really briefly from, from a really big imprint, I feel, I still feel like the same kind of impulse. I think the, I think the difference between a project that has a lot of structural edits that that I foresee that I pursue versus I don't pursue is actually how the author sees it. It's, it goes back to that author conversation. Like, do you want to be a partner in making these edits? If not, I definitely don't want to force them. I don't think it'll be enjoyable for them or for me to kind of come to that fruition and it won't be a product that they're proud of. Um, but that's, that's the real question um, that comes up there. Um, and I think, you know, I, I've, I know that I'm not the only editor, even at our imprint, let alone wider, who will go to their editor in chief with passion and say, like, these are the very specific things that I see here. I know this needs to change, but I'm confident that this is where we can get when we when we do those edits and the author is on board. Um, so so that's the difference. 
Yeah, that's a really good segue into the next question that I was going to ask you all, which is, can you talk about roughly what percentage of projects you're really interested in that ultimately don't make it through your editorial board? Um, Vivian, would you like to answer this question? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I get in roughly 300 to 350 manuscripts. I bring into acquisitions maybe 15. And depending on how that shakes out, depending. So I don't know. That sounds depressing. I'm very sorry. <laughs> No, we appreciate the specificity of the numbers, but yeah, it just goes to show also like how many manuscripts you all are being inundated with. Um, Yuka, would you like to answer that as well? Yeah, numbers are kind of similar, but, but I think that when I go to a, um, my colleagues with the project, um, I'm already sort of like, it could be a situation where I'm like, can somebody else read this? Because I think it's close, but I don't know if we're the right place. Like it's, it's sometimes that I've already made the decision that they need to reinforce. So it doesn't necessarily, at least in my case, I'm not always like pitching as, um, as I'm sort of having a conversation with um, the people who help me acquire books. Um, but yeah, I do think that a lot of, most submissions don't even make it to, the, to, to that stage. Um, and that, but once once they do make it to that stage, I think that again, um, we're pretty seriously considering it. Um, there have been times where I've been dissuaded, where I'm like, "Look at how you're talking about this. You know the answer," and I'm like, "Okay, yeah." Or um, or the other way, being like, "You keep talking about this book. You you have to you have to go after it." And and um, so so both things have happened. Thank you. We also got some questions about, um, just looping back to agents for a second, um, how important it is to be agented when sending in your manuscript. Um, and does that depend on the genre? For example, with poetry, uh, would you recommend that poets go through contests or flush pile submissions? So curious to hear uh, what your take on is on verse agented versus unagented submissions and what genre the writer might be writing in. Um, Elisa, would you maybe want to start us off since there was yeah. a part of poetry specifically? So at this right now, um, Tin House takes almost all agented submissions um, just because there's four, well, there's three full-time editors and then Hanif Abdurraqib is our editor at large in nonfiction. And so there's not that many of us. And so because of that, we have to manage our submission queue in some way and it's through agents. Um, but we also um, have opened up open reading periods three times a year for uh, all the different genres that we take. Um, and so that's an opportunity to like, if you're unagented to um, sort of not have to worry about that and to reach us directly. Um, as editors, we read everything that comes through those open reading periods. There's no, it's not slush like to us. It really is as if they were agented, we read all of them. Um, so that's something that um, is just to think about what, if, if you don't have an agent, what presses are having those opportunities to have an agented reading periods? Um, for poetry, it is a little different. I mean, obviously some poets do have agents who I've worked with, but um, a lot of poets are unagented as well. Um, and right now that is also through our open reading periods just to sort of manage that. Um, but I think like you can just like look at what different publishing houses have in terms of guidelines for how to submit for um, unagented work as well, if, if they're open to it. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, thank you. Um, would anyone else like to answer this question on agented versus unagented submissions and, and genre specifically? I think I mentioned this before, but Grey Wolf has, um, we don't have open submissions periods, but we have prizes. So we have the Great Wolf Press Nonfiction Prize um, once every, I think it's once every two years now, I can't remember. And then we also have an African Fiction Prize. Awesome, thank you. Um, thoughts on anthologies. I hear that it's hard to get anthologies published. How should someone prepare that pitch of an anthology? So um, I'll open that, I'll open the question to the floor. Uh, 
I published, I have published and started many anthologies. I love anthologies. Um, it's partially because I came from magazines and magazines are basically like a rolling anthology in my mind, or sometimes they can just be anthologies. Um, but yeah, I think, and I'm one of the projects I'm working on now is an anthology of essays about video games that Grey Wolf is publishing in November. So it's been awesome. I love working on them. Um, but I, I think I, that was, um, that anthology came about because Carmen Maria Machado and J. Robert Lennon, who are both Grey Wolf Press authors, were just talking to the editors one day about how they are playing a lot of video games <laughs> during, during the pandemic. And, and then I think one of my colleagues was like, why isn't there an anthology about that? And then we made them do it. So, so it was much more um, or, organic. Um, yeah, I, I think that they're, they can be tough. Um, I guess they're tough to sell, but they're also, they can also be tough just because they work slightly differently within the production, in production. And, it, it, um, and so, some, so sometimes it's just more work. Um, so I would say, I think the question was whether or not they're, they're harder to sell. And I think the answer is yes, <laughs> or the harder to pitch. And, and I think, um, again, if you have a subject matter that nobody else has done before, then that's a plus. Like we, we, had, we sort of looked at it and noticed that nobody else has done um, a video game anthology. So, so that was a, a big plus in, in us moving forward despite all the challenges. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, we have a question pertaining to conferences and with AWP looming on the horizon, uh, what would you recommend that unpublished first time attendees prepare in advance of a major conference like this? Um, what expectations or aspirations do you think would be constructive to arrive with? I mean, talk about building community. AWP is the perfect place to build community. Um, that's, you know, kind of a lot of a lot of where I met writers is from AWP. I think have a game plan, see what panels you want to go to, Dep you know, it might even be the subject, it might even be the people that you are interested in hearing speak. Um, and I think there's a bunch of off conf like uh, um, off campus readings and go to a lot of those like meet people talk pe talk to people it's like the perfect place to really just talk to people you would not be able to in in your town or city um yeah i mean have a game plan and then have fun i think is the thing i think everyone is it's like the second year after lockdown that it's come back so everyone's going to be really awkward and weird but you know, you're going to be awkward and weird. They're going to be awkward and weird. It's fine. Um, but I had a lot of fun last year. So <laughs> um, I think I think it really is just making the most of that time and, and building those connections and, and feel, finding your people there. It's, the, it's, it's a great, great, great place to do that. That's great advice. Yeah. Um, would anyone else like to answer the question of conferences and how do you prepare as a um, unpublished author? Yeah, I think the recommendation of offsite events is really great just because, um, you know, I've only been to AWP a couple of times, but it just feels like in the actual convention center and the panels, it's pretty intense. Like there's a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of energy. Um, as someone who's a little like more reserved, it's just like a lot for me to take in. Um, and so I think the nice thing about waiting and talking to people at offsite events is like they're more casual, they're more spaced out. There's a little more room to breathe. Um, and I think that's the chance to have better conversations versus like you might see a writer you really love and you want to connect with them after their panel, but they might still be in a deep panel brain. Um, so, you know, there's there's multiple opportunities at AWP to see people, which is really cool. Um, and yeah, drink lots of water. I know that's such a mom thing to say, but drink lots of water because <laughs> it's it's a real again, I keep using the word marathon, but wow, AWP is a lot. So all conferences are a lot. Tin House Workshop is a lot. I'm constantly trying to drink water at the Tin House Summer Workshop, so. Hydration, so important. Um, so it's a lot of standing and talking from what I remember, so yeah. Uh, we have time for, I think, maybe two more questions. Um, so if your manuscript has been on submission for over a year with an experienced agent and did not result in a book deal, do you have advice for what you can do next? I can jump in. Um, I think that 
it's great to have an agent at the table with you to kind of talk about what might have gone not your way. And I want to emphasize that just because you didn't get a book deal, it does not say anything about the quality of your writing. It does not say anything about whether or not you're a great writer or this idea wasn't right. Um, but maybe it is time to try something new to throw another thing on the on the wall. Like, don't let that stop you from continuing on with your projects um, and and see, you know, see, see whether the other the next idea you have sparks a partnership um, and know that you can always go back to the to whatever idea you had um, that that didn't, that hasn't yet had that partnership. Bring it back later. Maybe the right editor didn't see it. <laughs> maybe it didn't spark in that moment maybe there was something on their list that they that was too similar in that moment that they couldn't pitch there are thousands of reasons why that didn't work out that have nothing to do with the quality of your writing so so yeah so I say don't stop keep going um and come back also I always tell writers too when you're out query when your book's out on submission work on something else um always just be thinking about what that next project is like because then you're not being you know you don't want to put all that anxiety out in the world that way and then not be productive and do the things that you were meant to do, which is to write. Um, you know, there's so much you can be doing to kind of help quell that and help kind of just work on that next project and be excited about something else too while that's kind of in the background. And kind of like on, on that same thing, everybody here has been talking about how long-term this is and how long-term the partnerships are. And that's just reinvesting in your own career. And, and, you know, it's another exciting thing to talk to your potential editor for, because everyone is going to ask you, Hey, so what else are you working on? What else are you interested in exploring and writing? Um, and Hey, you've already been working on something and now you can share it. And that's really exciting. Yeah. Such good advice. Um, Okay, uh, and one last question. Um, I'm wondering what you haven't read enough of yet, but might be excited to see more of with regard to Asian American voices uh, who are submitting work to you. I mean, it's such a great question. I feel like we're all still trying to, I mean, for me, it's, I mean, I don't have an answer because I feel like I've only seen the tip of the iceberg, right? Like I've been acquiring for 10 years and I still feel like it's a small portion of what we are, we can still acquire. I think it's just, there's just so much. I mean, we're not a monolith. Clearly you can see that on the panel. You can see that from the chat um, where everyone's from and their background, there's just so many different stories. I saw a question in the Q in the Q and A about, you know, they're a, they're a Korean adoptee and I have one on my list, I actually have two, whatever, you know, like it, you have different stories. It's just, what is your specific version of that story? What do you wanna say? Um, so I think there's just, there's just such a variety that we just even haven't even tapped into yet. And I'm excited to see I'm excited to meet you all down the road when you have when you have that book ready. Yeah, I want to emphasize everything Vivian said. I feel like there are there are no there are no quotas. There's nothing like that nonsense <laughs> um, I'm here. And I just I feel like this is a really good question, but I'm finding it really difficult to answer because I similarly give me every give me the story that you want to tell, and I'm excited to read it. Um, I guess if we're talking specifically about the kinds of lists that we're trying to build, um, I am working a lot in the in the like speculative genre space. Um, so particularly stories that you have to share that have any range of speculative in it is fascinating to me and something that I can bring back and publish per my per like the imprint and what spaces I'm trying to grow there. Um, but but yeah, anything otherwise just anything under the sun. Yeah, uh, Elisa and Yuka, would you like to weigh in as well on this question? Yeah, I think as you were saying, it's like surprising, like such a hard question to answer because it's true. Like, I guess I, I think like anything that comes my way, I'd be excited about. Um, and I think too, like, I think we were maybe thinking about uh, a question a, a while back about like, how has Asian American um, sort of work changed or marketed differently over 
time. And I think what's really cool as Vivian commented on is we're definitely not a monolith in any way. And like, I even think about how, so we have a short story collection by Talia Lakshmi Kaluri that came out last September. And then I have a book with Cleo Chan coming out, also a short story collection in August. And yes, they are both Asian American writers, but we are promoting their books in such different ways because they are different authors and they wrote very different books. And I think what's cool is like, um, when something comes my way by an Asian American writer, I'm so open to like, how can we envision this that's bigger, that's different, that's special. Like, um, so I'm just so open to like whatever might be coming. Um, and that's, it's just exciting to think about. Yeah, I agree with everybody. It's, it's not anything specific that I'm looking for specifically from Asian American writers, I don't think. Um, I'd love to see more of everything. Um, I'm currently looking a little bit more for nonfiction, I guess, than I am for fiction. And I've been telling agents and my colleagues that I want to, I want a book about sports, just because or bodies or performance or you know something like that. I haven't seen, and that's not just Asian American, but in general, I haven't seen um, exactly the type of work I want uh, about that about that area. Awesome. Thank you all so much for um, weighing in on that question and for and for being here. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you so much to our wonderful panelists. Um, and thanks to everyone for your really thoughtful questions during our Q&A as well. We'll be sending out a recording of this event within the next week, as well as a feedback form. We'd love to know um, what your experience was. Um, we'll be hosting one more panel in this series coming later this fall. So we hope to see you then as well. Keep a lookout for that. Um, and thank you so much for coming. Have a great rest of your day. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone.